Looks like we have a quorum present, yes? Okay, thank you. Good evening, today is August 11, 2021, and it is 5.01 p.m. As a quorum of the board is in attendance, I would like to call to order the meeting of the Central Health Board of Managers. The first item of business is public communication. Members of the public who wish to make comments during the public communication portion of the meeting must have registered with Central Health via the online form or by telephone no later than 3.30 p.m. today. Yesenia, did anyone register to make comments? Yes, there's one person registered. Thank you, uh, Yesenia, if you would please proceed. Um, so um, members of the public who wish to speak during public communication, um, there is one. I will now read the guidelines for this meeting's public communication. Please introduce yourself by name before beginning your comments. Also, if your comments will focus on a specific item or issue on the agenda, please indicate the full item number. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Staff will be timing each speaker and will be announced and will announce when a speaker has reached their time limit to ensure the efficiency of the meeting. Once we have let speakers know they've reached their limit, we will allow 30 more seconds to wrap up their comments before they are muted. Once again, speakers will be muted at three and a half minutes to ensure the efficiency of the meeting. The board chair may, in her discretion, impose additional limits on time or comments. Due to the restrictions of the Open Meetings Act, the board may be restricted in discussing any items that are not listed on the agenda for the meeting. The board may choose to set aside any new issues for discussion at a future meeting. And at this time, I will call on our public input speaker, Mike Geeslin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike Geeslin, President and CEO of Central Health. Uh, members, thank you for the opportunity to provide some comments here today. Uh, I'd like to do two things. One, I would like to thank uh, David Duncan for his work and stepping up as an interim director for the Health and Social Services Division in the Travis County Attorney's Office and guiding us through these past several months, especially in a, a pandemic environment. So thank you very much, David. The service is very much appreciated. Uh, second, I would like to welcome and introduce to you Trelisha Brown. Many of you have met Trelisha Brown. Many of us have had the privilege of working with her over the past uh, actually a couple of years, I think. Um, she's been with the Travis County Attorney's Office, but she is the new director of the Health and Social Services Division. Uh, she has, uh, has health insurance, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I slipped the tongue there. She has health law practice in both the public and private sector as a health attorney. And so we are pleased uh, to have her leadership and to have her here at the table. So welcome, Trulisha. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, David Duncan, for your incredible service. And uh, Talisha Brown, thank you. Um, and we welcome you. Is, is there any other uh, public communication at this time, Yesenia? That was the only one. OK, thank you very much. Um, we will move now to the regular agenda. Item number one, receive and take appropriate action on a contract with Guidehouse Inc for strategic systems of care planning services. And I believe that Mike Giesland, Monica Crowley, and Belina Bunch will be presenting. I will turn to them. Thank you. Yes, thank you again, members. Um, this is about our systems planning work as we look through a health equity lens. And so today we're coming to you uh, for a request to uh, move forward on a contract uh, with Guidehouse for a consulting engagement. Um, remember, we have presented uh, on this work in many different on many different occasions, principally through the Strategic Planning Committee meeting. Uh, some of it's well underway. We have some immediate uh, care and lines of service that we're addressing in this fiscal year, have proposed budgets for the next fiscal year. And so while directionally we're, we have started and we are headed towards a good place, this contract here is about taking it up to the next level. So. Uh, again, this is a continuation um, in terms of the work that has already begun and that the board has been briefed on. And with that, I will turn it over to Monica Crowley and Belina. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gieslin, uh, Monica Crowley, Central Health. Uh, next slide, please. So we ground each of our presentations on the system of care planning work in this uh, cog slide that is the depiction of the components of a high functioning system of care 
and that also shows uh, identified gap areas. And like Mike um, said before, Mr. Giesland said, you've seen this before. Dr. Alan Shalsha, our chief medical officer, usually speaks to this slide as he did last week, introducing the presentation on the immediate service delivery focus areas that were identified as priorities for the fiscal year 2022 budget that uh, was presented on last week in the strategic planning meeting. And this engagement is a continuation. And as Mr. Giesland said, uh, a scaling up and a taking to the next level this work. Next slide, please. Um, this slide depicts the phases of the equity-based systems planning prioritization um, work. If you remember, phase one was the initial development of the COG slide and the working development of the components of a high functioning system of care with an initial internal high level assessment of gaps in our current system. This work took place internally and along with enterprise partners like Dr. Nick Yagoda from Community Care and Dr. Mary Carol Jennings from Sendero Health Plans. And it took place from uh, July 2020 to December 2020. Uh, phase two is the work that we just finished in identifying the immediate service delivery areas um, to uh, suggest for the fiscal year 2022 budget priorities, which uh, in, included working with subject matter experts and um, prioritizing these initial gaps based upon um, the prioritization factors that John Morgan went over with you uh, during the strategic planning committee. And these included substance use disorder, behavioral health services, additional specialty care focus, uh, services for people experiencing homelessness, care transitions, and clinical education. If you notice, we have boxes checked instead of icons on phase one and phase two, and that's because we've um, completed phase two. Uh, this engagement is scaling up the systems planning work and will take us to this next level of phase three in which we're planning for both next year and the coming years across the entire system of care at a deeper level. Um, this includes a formal community needs assessment for the safety net, uh, as well as intense patient and community engagement. It requires additional resources to be able to assess not just the care that we're providing today, but also assessing needs and disparities in the communities that we could and should be serving today, but that we're not. Uh, it also involves assessing the current supply of those services uh, across all of the service lines that we need to be part of a comprehensive system, as well as the future supply needed to meet projected additional demands. This phase and the consulting engagement that will provide the additional help that we need to conduct this more intense process will continue with regular presentations to and the gathering of feedback from uh, the board and the strategic planning committee and will culminate in a service delivery strategic plan that will be recommended to the board in early 2022 uh, that we'll use to help advise our healthcare service delivery work moving forward. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this engagement will be funded through grant dollars and not tax dollars. Um, although our internal work was very productive, uh, and we were able to apply data about disparities and develop prioritization factors to identify the immediate gap areas, uh, we realized that additional research and analytics and community engagement, uh, if, if we're keeping up with current work as well, that we would require additional support. And so in uh, early um, 2021, we applied to the Episcopal Health Foundation for a grant to fund this support. Uh, the Episcopal Health Foundation conditionally awarded uh, up to $600,000 in a grant to develop this foundational strategic and services delivery plan for the safety net healthcare system in Travis County. Uh, there were two conditions of the grant. The first one is that Central Health would select a consultant through a procurement process to provide the required support and that the Central Health Board accept the grant. The board accepted the grant at the June 30 board meeting, and tonight we're asking the board to take action regarding uh, the consultant that received uh, the highest scores in the procurement process 
Uh, I'm going to provide a, a little bit of additional background and some uh, information that the board requested about Guidehouse Inc., the firm that received the highest scores. And then I'm going to hand it over to Belina Bunch, our procurement manager, to um, finish up the presentation by describing the procurement process. Next slide, please. Um, it, first, here's a little bit of information about the Guidehouse team that will be involved in this engagement. Uh, it, some of the demographics were requested, and so uh, the team is 18% Hispanic with two members. There are three African American members of the team, four Asian members of the team, and um, two white members. Uh, they also are working with two hub subcontractors, both for community engagement and planning support. One is a company called Broadus uh, that provides market assessment and planning support. And the other one is a company called Case Strategies out of Dallas uh, that are experts in communications and community engagement. Uh, and just a couple, little bit more information about some of the key staff, Katrina Keys, who's the president of Case Strategies, uh, has works with clients across the state of Texas, such as Parkland, uh, JPS in Fort Worth, and TxDOT in communications and community engagement, um, and particularly around strategic planning efforts. She did all of the work with Parkland uh, on the efforts that led to the new, um, the new Parkland Hospital a couple of years ago. Uh, Dr. Abby Sharma is an MD, MBA, and MPH who is new um, to Central Health uh, in working with Guidehouse, but um, is, lives in Houston and is currently leading Guidehouse's efforts for the Veterans Administration to assess and address access to care issues for the VA's most vulnerable uh, populations in communities across the United States. Uh, and then also Michael Nugent, who is an MBA and CHFP and is our central health subject matter expert. Many of you um, have worked with Mike Nugent before in the past when Guidehouse was known as Navigant, and you are familiar with, with him in, in prior presentations. Next slide, please. Some of the relevant experience that Guidehouse is, is as they are a national leader in safety net system planning and development with an equity lens. Uh, they're currently working on uh, 60 plus safety net provider and payer engagements across the United States. And in 2020, they provided services to um, 25 Medicaid states. Uh, they also have worked with Harris Health in building capacity for public health innovation, strategic partnerships and sustainability with JPS Health, which is the hospital district in Fort Worth to build an integrated strategic financial operating plan master physician facilities plan and physician operations plan. And they're currently working with the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities for its strategic plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the scope of work that has been proposed tonight um, and given approval by the board tonight will bring back more detail to the strategic planning committee next month on the scope of work and technical approach, but it includes three phases uh, between the beginning of the engagement in January of 2022 um, with extensive communications and community engagement going on throughout the entire period. Um, the, the first phase is a one to two weeks of project planning. Um, the next phase is approximately 10 to 13 weeks of health needs assessment um, review and includes assessing the population and community health needs, both current and future, a review of the current system capabilities and will result in the de deliverables of a current state assessment report, future state needs report, final complete, completed community needs assessment report, and final gap analysis report and a system review and validation report. Uh, and then the next phase, phase three, is the multi-year service delivery strategic planning process, which will result in a proposed multi-year service delivery strategic plan, as well as an ongoing prioritization framework that Central Health can use 
and a prioritization recommendations report for um, the, the immediate future. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposed terms of the agreement are for an additional, an initial contract term of one year with four possible renewals, uh, and the contract was negotiated at an amount not to exceed $494,000, funded through a $600,000 grant from the Episcopal Health Foundation. Uh, Belina? Hi, I'm Belina Bunch. I'm the procurement manager for Central Health. As we go through the um, solicitation process, we launched the RFP for this, um, for this solicitation in March of this year. Um, and then we advertised it in four local newspapers in both English and Spanish, and also posted the solicitation on three different websites, including Central Health's website, um, BidSync, which is a procurement site for government solicitations and procurement facilitations, and the ESBD, which is a statewide website for a business daily search. Um, the solicitation was posted for a month and closed on April 19th. The stats that we obtained from BitSync showed that over 32,000 vendors were notified of the solicitation, which includes more than 6,000 hub vendors. We also sent out a targeted email to about 811 vendors and that target email, those addresses come from the ESBD's website. I mean, the CMBL website, which is the state website. We had seven responsive and responsible proposals that were received and they were evaluated by our evaluation team for qualifications and the best overall value. None of the prime contractors um, that submitted successful proposals were hub vendors but five of the seven proposals submitted um, sub hub contractors. The evaluation committee was comprised of seven central health staff members and one UT professor, all of which are culturally diverse and experienced in working with the population that was targeted through this proposal. And after doing their evaluations for each proposal, they all um, came to an agreement that Guidehouse um, was to be the awardee. Thank you. And that completes our presentation. Thank you very much for that thorough presentation. Uh, members, are there any questions at this time? Manager Musaita, if you have a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I have a quick question. In terms of the contract, um, it's for renewal four years. And is it every year with uh, about half a million dollars? Is that oh. what the or is it the entirety, the entirety of the contract is that amount of money? The not to exceed for any, for the entire uh, entirety of any period is the $494,000. Okay, because it wasn't really clear when I read it. Thank you. Members, any other uh, questions? Manager Jones, do you have a question? Yes, I'm interested in terms of two questions. One is on the bidding process, did this, was there any national vendors that made any of the cuts that you included in terms of your process of evaluation? And secondly, um, does Guidehouse have experience in working with either uh, health districts, either in the state or other places, that contract out through its partners for the delivery of services? And if so, how do they work to do the, get the assessment through those vendors? That may, question may be too early to ask, but I was just trying to see if, the, if you had any answer on that. I can answer number one with, um, with regards to the national vendors. So BidSync is um, a repository of um, many vendors and some are national vendors and they register in different states. And so if we have vendors who are registered in Texas, we have quite a few that are registered in Texas, but their home office is out of state or in another state, then they, if they um, signed up for the correct classification that was um, associated with this solicitation, then yes, they did get an invitation, or at least they got, um, yeah, an invitation to view the bid. 
Uh, Mike Giesland, did you want to add to this? No, actually, she, she mentioned it. I was just going to seek clarification from Manager Jones. Did he mean domiciled anywhere but serving in multiple states? Is that how he was defining national? Well, my question goes more to the question that there were no minority vendors that met the guideline or were able that qualified, I guess. And I just find that difficult to believe if we're talking about na nationwide opportunities. Now, perhaps they didn't know, they didn't, uh, weren't engaged. Uh, I was just wondering how that came about. That's, that's an interesting uh, result. So when I looked at the stats on bid sync, Manager Jones, um, it did show that over 32,000 invitations went out. And we can also see how many vendors viewed the actual solicitation, and it was 99 vendors that viewed um, the solicitation, but only um, seven of them chose to submit a proposal. Okay, uh, and you wouldn't happen to know of those 99 that viewed them, the, um, this, the demographics of those? Uh, yes, sir, I can get it while uh, Monica is answering the second part of your question. Okay, thank you. And the second part of the question was if um, Guidehouse has experience working with uh, hospital districts in Texas that only contract out for services. And um, I'm, I, you know, uh, so the answer to that is actually they do because uh, Guidehouse as Navigant um, Inc. has worked with Central Health in the past before. So, and Central Health is really the only hospital district in Texas uh, that's a large urban hospital district that contracts out with, um, you know, for, for its hospital services. Um, and Guidehouse, it is a national vendor uh, with experience working with other hospital districts in Texas. They've worked with um, Harris Health and uh, John Peter Smith in Fort Worth on strategic planning. Um, and, and they've also worked with um, Central Health in the past, so they, they are familiar with our model. And I can't remember the rest of, of that question. Well, I don't think I fully well, answered it. No, you, you answered it. I, I thought Natchez County had a similar condition as, as Travis County uh, in uh, terms no, of the health district. Nueces County is a member of the, um, it, it's, I, th I think, a Christus Hospital. Um, and so they are a member of the board of the Christus Hospital that provides um, public services. Uh, and I think they also provide some of the intergovernmental transfers for that hospital. Um, but it, it, it's not um, the same type of relationship that Central Health has, has with Ascension. Okay, and then the last part of that question was, Given our expertise in working with them, are you comfortable that the what we're trying to get their assessment uh, will be meaningful um, given the track records we've had? I, I have no opinion on them either way. I'm just trying to uh, ascertain whether or not that experience has been good. Yes, it, it has been. And, and Mike, if, if you want, want to weigh in on that as well. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? I'm having a difficult time here. I was just asking, given the track record we've had with uh, this vendor, has it been successful in terms of getting what we need timely, effectively, engaging communities and, of, and our partners uh, in order for us to make this decision? I assume yes, that sir. we have, but I want to hear that proactively from you all before we vote on this. Yes, sir. It has, and had it not, then we would be having a much different discussion. Okay. Manager Jones, 35 of the 99 vendors were, um, were hub, hub vendors that viewed the solicitation. Okay. All right, then. Thanks very much. That was very helpful and informative. You're welcome. Members, any other questions at this time? Madam Chair? Yes. If there are no other questions, I'd like to make a motion. Please do, thank you. 
I move that the board delegate authority to the president and CEO to negotiate and execute a contract for up to $500,000 on the terms identified in the staff presentation or terms at least as favorable um, to Central Health as those discussed. We have a motion by Manager Bell. Is there a second? I see Manager Masaitev. Is that a second? I saw a second. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? If not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose, oppose, same sign. Any abstaining, same sign. Not seeing any. Motion passes, thank you members. We'll now move to agenda item number two. On our agenda, receive and discuss a presentation on the proposed Central Health Fiscal Year FY 2022 budget and tax rate including proposed strategic priorities. Jeff Canodal, Lisa Owens, and Lester uh, Hanahar will be presenting. I will turn it over to them. Thank you, Chair Greenberg. Um, tonight we are presenting um, another um, um, iteration of our fiscal year 2022 proposed budget. And just as a, as a quick reminder, um, we are not asking for action. We'll be back um, at a subsequent meeting to begin the process, and I think we'll go over, over that um, later in the presentation. Um, as you mentioned, um, I'm Jeff Canodal, uh, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, presenting with me is also Lisa Owens and Lester Hanaher. Um, we're going to be talking um, um, about our budgeting and tax rate processes. Um, and hopefully you can uh, indulge me in that for a few slides up front. Um, we will talk specifically about uh, property tax rates and information related to the uh, Travis Central Appraisal District uh, certified role, which is one of the key milestones that occur in the budgeting process for us uh, in order for us to set our tax rate. And then last but certainly not least is the actual fiscal year 22 budget detail uh, that we will spend most of the presentation going through, um, including some changes that we've had from our last meeting. So next slide, please. So this gets into the part of indulging me for a few moments related to um, budgeting and tax rate setting. Um, <clears throat> as we look at budgeting in, in overall tax rate setting as far as um, how, we, um, how much revenue to bring in for the services that we um, expect or want to provide. Um, we take into account um, the risks that are out um, in our environment, and I've listed a few. This is a, kind of a rehash of an earlier slide that we uh, presented earlier this year. But you see the risks that, that are out there, certainly not limited to only these risks, but um, fairly standard risks that um, have existed uh, uh, with Central Health for both a number of years and uh, will continue to be risk, environmental risks that we would certainly want to at least uh, be cognizant of. And then secondly, known events. And it's no secret that we, have been building our reserves up because we know that there are some events that are going to happen that um, will have an impact on uh, our reserve levels. And I've listed some of those known events um, that we've been planning for uh, for a number of years, uh, specifically around both the 1115 uh, uh, waiver program, generally speaking, um, you know, what, what, comes after the 1115 waiver um, <clears throat> and specifically the uh, 1115 DESRIT program, which there is funding uh, that's currently in the Community Care Collaborative. And you'll see in a, in a chart here uh, coming up that uh, eventually <clears throat> the uh, cost associated with um, uh, the spend amounts in the Community Care Collaborative will transition over to Central Health. And then we've also um, uh, um, discussed uh, transitioning to, to a more direct payment model for healthcare services. In the past, we've had a, an indirect model and this uh, transition is 
not a transition that happens um, quickly. It's more like steering a big cargo ship. And at some point you, you set the direction, you start the turning and it goes very slowly, um, but you maintain that turn um, to get to your destination. And so that has been a, a process that we've undergone uh, the last couple of years. And uh, you'll see in our forward looking budget when we uh, anticipate that having an impact. And then certainly construction and operation of new clinical facilities. Um, we know that uh, um, construction wise, uh, Austin has a, a real hot market. Um, we are um, attempting to construct new clinical facilities um, within our budgets, but also as those clinics are built, we'll bring on additional access um, for those facilities which increases our operational cost related to, to uh, uh, those clinics. And then certainly uh, transitioning to uh, a, as a direct healthcare provider, um, not last legislative session, but the prior legislative session, we received approval for a, to become a direct provider of those services. And we've been working through the uh, administrative process um, to um, actually bring up those services, uh, both administratively and clinically speaking. Um, and so you'll see that that begins to have certainly a more direct impact um, in some of the future years. But all these events result in, in, in taking a, a more longer term outlook that provides uh, sustainable funding uh, for the system of care service levels and underlines the financial strategies for both reserve levels and establishes a long-term process to set the central health property tax rate. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share with the board um, our latest um, rating um, as it relates to our um, upcoming contractual obligation issue, we um, obtained a third party rating from Moody's. And uh, our rating, um, and this was the first time that we've used Moody's, our rating was AA2, which is the uh, second highest rating in Texas for a hospital district. So I think the board should be congratulated on, you know, some of the aspects of budgeting and financial management that they have approved over the years. Um, you see some of our uh, credit strengths um, related to our liquidity and our, our debt burden. And of course, we're in Travis County, which is a fast growing uh, area that um, uh, will continue to provide a, a uh, robust tax base related to uh, <clears throat> funding. Uh, you also see uh, some of the challenges that we have uh, historically, um, we've provided, uh, we Central Health have provided support for um, some of our affiliates. And then uh, certainly uh, some of our challenges as it relates to our providers and federal revenues. But overall, the rating outlook um, reflects the uh, Central Health's role in the county. Um, and then there were also some comments related around uh, both conservative uh, budgeting practices and the uh, tax base that will enable the district to maintain uh, a solid financial position. And again, that, that, that's a result of, of our, our board um, working um, with staff and with the Travis County Commissioners to establish those financial positions. And then the uh, summary uh, looks at you know, what factors uh, might lead to an upgrade and you see just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's about cash reserves and uh, uh, certainty. So, so as you have some uncertainty and, and certainly in, in the preceding slide, you saw some uncertainty um, that, that has an impact on, on how third parties will look at um, um, entities that they're uh, uh, rating. And then some uh, factors that could lead to uh, a downgrade, including you know, reduction in any of the funding levels, uh, federal, state, or local, 
um, any economic uh, um, condition that uh, or, or downturn that could result um, in contraction of the tax base, and then just any further leveraging uh, without um, corresponding tax base or the capacity to support that leveraging around uh, um, those costs um, related to to that item. Uh, next slide. So this next slide is um, um, it's a 15 year look at both history, present and future. And um, we've presented the history before and I'm uh, kind of tried to combine all this in a real long term uh, look because at times our, depending on what our reserve levels are, um, we um, do budget for our contingency reserve in our healthcare delivery budget. And at times it can skew our budget um, in, in a way that it's hard to understand um, if there's any correlation between our budget and, and the level of services that we provide. And then secondly, you'll see, um, and <clears throat> sorry, the, Hopefully the color coding is showing up, up okay. But on the, uh, the green levels, um, those are actual uh, historical amounts uh, through our uh, financial audit process. Um, but they also represent a period of time where we had indirect funding um, related to how we funded in particular hospital services. And then you see beginning in fiscal year 20, um, there was legislation that created the uh, local provider participation fund known as the LPPF, um, which changed up the dynamics of who's providing the local shares to participate in some of the supplemental programs. And then you see um, kind of moving uh, a little bit further into the future, some of the known events that, um, that we talked about on the preceding slide. You know, as we look at transitioning to a direct service funding and we look at the end of the DESERT program and the transition of the uh, community care collaborative budget amounts and services over to the uh, central health budget that we would anticipate that happening um, during this uh, look into the future. Next slide. So keeping that in mind and keeping in mind that um, the the prior years, the actual amounts were somewhat volatile. Um, um, and a lot of that volatility, again, we were funding indirect uh, uh, services through an indirect funding model, which really was through the use of intergovernmental transfers. That when you look at the actual utilization, and this is just a, a real simple uh, utilization of uh, patient and visit counts um, that combine both ambulatory and hospital uh, services. But when you look at the, the actual patient count and the uh, visit counts, that you see a, a big upward trend um, over history up through 2019. And of course, 2020 has been challenging. Uh, there were two things that really happened that um, um, impacted the, the downturn. One was just COVID. I think we're all uh, familiar with that. And then secondly was the EPIC implementation at Community Care. And of course they had to spend some time training uh, their providers and staff to use that the system. And of course we, uh, we would expect productivity to increase once the, the staff are, are trained on, on the system. Um, but uh, during that implementation period, just the combination of both the, the uh, EPIC Im implementation and COVID um, has actually produced a, a slight decrease. Um, I, I think everyone um, expects the volume as we come out of COVID and hopefully that's sooner rather than later that uh, we would continue to see both an increase and there more than likely is some sort of vacuum as it relates to services that we'll have to accommodate in future years. But the takeaway from this slide, um, from my perspective is 
Um, when you look at the, the prior slide and look at the volatility that we had as it related to indirect funding, um, there was a lot of volatility in that slide. Uh, there were some timing differences. I think in 2016, there was a, a timing difference related to uh, intergovernmental transfers where there was two years worth of transfers um, in, in that one year that it doesn't correlate with the level of services. So uh, again, that chart, it goes up and down year to year. Uh, this has a, a really nice trend, upward trend of increase in services. Um, I would expect in the future as we transition to a more direct funding model that they will correlate closer. But I just wanted to point that out. Um, it is a little confusing when you look at how we budget and the, again, the contingency reserve is included in our healthcare delivery uh, budget. Just stripping that out, it really does show the volatility we've experienced over the last uh, several years. Um, but again, correlating with that with the service levels, I think, uh, shows that we've been increasing services to our community over this period of time. So the next slide, again, sticking with looking out over history. Um, this is our um, uh, reserve level slide. Um, uh, in the past, we've shown uh, different uh, tax rate increases year over year in a separate slide. Um, this is really how, how we look at it. Um, and you might wonder, well, how do we look at reserve levels? How do we look at where to set the tax rate? How do we look at it over a long term? And this chart really shows, I think, at least visually, um, how, how we do that. And so what you see on the chart on the left are just days of cash on hand. And you know, days of cash on hand are, are an important metric for us as it relates to uh, you know, certainly how the bond rating uh, entities look at us related to liquidity. But we want to have enough cash on hand. Uh, to accommodate the events that we know are going to occur, uh, to give us sufficient levels for any uh, risk that exists out there that um, may impact our levels so that we don't have to make an immediate course correction uh, due to those risks. And so you see on this chart, I've listed out some of those known events. Um, we've been planning for this um, over the last uh, um, seems like several years, but I'll say four or five years, we've known these events were going to occur and we've been setting our tax rate to have more of a level buildup of reserves so that <clears throat> had we not built up reserves and these events happen, we would be looking at a cut in funding and um, more importantly, uh, potentially cutting services or, or lessening our expenses rather than having a way to grow our reserves and then to expand uh, and provide the services that we've needed to provide year over year, um, both historically and over this longer period of time. And so you see the, the three different tax rates that um, we've talked about earlier this year in our forecast period, uh, 5%, 6%, and 6.9%. And so these would be the increases year over year um, related to the tax revenue. And then you see each line um, at each year has a um, days of cash on hand. Um, and then you see at the very far right, um, hopefully it shows up okay, I'm gonna call it our preferred landing area. So where do we wanna land over this this long period of time because we know we're building up reserves, but we know that um, our expenditures, um, because of some of these known events, um, are going to increase. And there, there will be times that we're not structurally balanced in the sense that our healthcare expenditures um, will exceed um, the revenue that we bring in. So it's really been a, a really um, a powerful. Uh, planning tool that we've used. And you see that um, looking specifically at the chart, the 6% year-over-year tax increase, which is the purple line, 
um, by the year 2028, it gets us to our desired landing area. And our landing area really is, as we, as we look at these known events, um, we want to have a, an area where we're sufficiently reserved and, and we're becoming structurally balanced. And that's what that means when it says the trend is flattening. So our reserve levels aren't continuing to decrease, but instead they're gonna start flattening out. And then based on uh, other historical um, events that are even beyond this one, we'll have to deal with that. But we certainly wanna position our organization uh, financially to be able to accommodate whatever those future events might be outside of even this, this uh, uh, projection period. And so again, uh, 120 to 150 days is our desired area. Um, you'll see the 6.9%, uh, uh, the line at the top, you see it starts decreasing and it actually starts flattening out in, in 2027, um, but the rate um, the reserve levels are higher than um, they're higher than what our landing area is, and so from an equity equitable standpoint for our taxpayers over a long period of time, we you know we want to be cognizant that um, you know we want to maintain a, a tax rate that um, uh, maintains and provides the services that central health feel are necessary um, without creating excess reserves um, that taxpayers would have to absorb over this period. And then lastly, you see the 5% right, um, which is on the bottom line. And you see it's just a constant decline and it doesn't start flat, flattening out and it's uh, below our landing area. And so <clears throat> that's how we have come up using this as a planning tool of recommending our, our tax rate uh, increase of 6%. And we would look at that um, over a long period of time. Okay, so enough Sorry, about Jeff. Could you could you pause just a minute? I just want to remind members to please mute your phones. Dr. Zamora. Okay. Thank you. So um, so that's the um, his uh, uh, future looking. Um, getting a little bit more into the present on the next slide. Um, we've updated our um, tax rate slide related to central health and um, the major Texas hospital districts. And you see uh, for fiscal year 2021, our rate was a little over 11 cents. Um, and you see the rates of all the other districts. And then the uh, percentage represents the um, pro rata percentage of the hospital uh, district tax burden um, from an overall overlapping taxing jurisdiction in those counties. And so you see that central health is uh, a little bit over 4.3% and then followed up by Harris. And then there are some other districts that are a little above 10%. Next slide. So this next slide, um, we've shown this before, uh, we've updated it slightly. <coughs> it shows a comparison of the uh, Texas hospital districts. Uh, it's a debt comparison per capita. And uh, historically, central health has always been um, at a very low rate per capita, simply because we haven't had much debt. Um, we have also on the second bar there have projected out um, an amount related to our proposed uh, contractual obligation issuance, um, what the debt per capita would be um, related to that proposed issuance. And you see that we compare very favorably to um, all the districts. And I would actually argue that we compare favorably even to Tarrant County. Uh, Tarrant County um, has been trying to uh, begin construction of a new hospital um, for a number of years. I believe it was in 2018 or 2019. Uh, they had a vote and actually have approved uh, $800 million uh, for that new hospital facility. So, uh, so we are picking a point in time. 
Um, my guess is if we picked a point in time, uh, two or three years down the road, that uh, Tarrant County would be much higher than, than it currently is. But again, overall, I think it just uh, represents that uh, we do compare favorably um, both in the model that we have um, and uh, uh, from, a debt, from a financial metric standpoint, again, th these are the things that uh, bond rating entities look at and they really liked about um, both our model and how we uh, funded services. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lester Hanaher to go through uh, some information related around our tax rate. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and good evening, managers. I'm Lester Hanaher, the budget analyst at Central Health. Um, I'll continue talking about the tax rate as well as going in a little bit on the impact of the taxpayer. Um, so I think Jeff was mentioning our certified role came back from the Travis Central Appraisal District or TCAD on July 20th. The taxable values came back at $235.6 billion. Um, this is an increase of 8.3% over last year's values. Travis County has been fortunate um, over the last 16 year span, as you can see on the slide, we've, we've seen uh, continuous growth. This slide also outlines the change in the tax rate over the same period. The increase in the taxable values allows Central Health to keep its tax rate relatively flat over the past few years. Next slide, please. This is one of our taxpayer impact slides. Uh, with the updates to the TCAD information, we were seeing a reduction to the April estimates. The update actually reduces the tax bill by almost $10 from what we presented last June at $9.55 lower. This is still going to be a year over year increase to the overall tax bill at $39.75. There are a couple major factors that are driving these increases. The primary driver is um, the 8.7% increase to the average homestead value. Also with the, the increase to the debt, uh, the debt service rate. I also want to point out that the, the board did support an increase to the exemption from 88,500 to 100,000 for homesteads that qualify for 65 and older as well as disabled. This change will result in an overall $17 reduction to the tax bill for these homesteads. Next slide, please. This is another taxpayer impact slide that provides a view um, to the proposed tax bill by band. The annual increase, as you can see, by band ranges from $14 to $70, which ranges from 9.3 to 10.5% increase. Again, one of the major drivers for this is the appreciation value for each homestead at 8.7%. Now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Lisa Owens to talk through some of the changes to the budget since we met last June. Thank you. Good evening, Lisa Owens, Deputy CFO. So I'm gonna walk through our final proposed budget this evening. And as a reminder, there is no action. We will be back later this month to ask the board to start the tax rate process and budget approval process with setting a maximum tax rate, which will support our primary source of revenue, which is property tax revenue for FY22. Since the beginning of this process earlier this year, we've framed our strategic priorities for FY22 many of which continue the work we've been doing through the three objectives approved by the board uh, through FY24. In addition, many of the investments in our internal departments and programs will support the organizational excellence priorities that Mr. Gieslin outlined for you at our strategic planning committee in May. In order to develop the budget, we worked both externally and internally to gather feedback. Externally, uh, at we worked with our communication and community engagement team and at our end of the month meeting, you are gonna receive a very robust presentation on the community engagement around our priorities and budget. Uh, we're very excited about that work. It continues to grow and enhance every year and really appreciate the partnership we have um, with um, the enterprise partners to do that work. And then internally, we worked on uh, business cases. So at the request of the board of managers uh, through some questions that came through, there was a request to 
have the details of the business cases with the amounts and FTEs. So we prepared this additional information for you to show the healthcare delivery business cases and the administration uh, business cases that are outlined throughout the budget in their appropriate line items. So as uh, we talked about um, the tax rate and some highlights of the changes, there have not been very significant changes from what we presented in June. But to orient you to tonight's presentation, we are sharing with you the FY21 approved budget. We're also sharing what we presented in the preliminary draft, which was June 14th. And then we're sharing uh, our final proposed budget tonight. Uh, and we wanted to show the variance between what we talked about in June and what we talked about, what we're talking about today. So those are the columns that we've incorporated into these uh, worksheets. Given the depth of the process um, that we, uh, the previous presentations that we did, and specifically I would reference the June 30th budget presentation that was a very detailed overview of um, our healthcare delivery programs and the investments we're making uh, in our healthcare services. Um, I'm gonna focus tonight just on the changes um, and refer back to that June 30th presentation. So as Lester mentioned, we did receive the certified role. Uh, we use this information to calculate our certified no new revenue rate and voter approved rate. And as a result, our tax rate is proposed to be slightly less than original. We proposed and this results um, in a reduction of our proposed tax revenue of about 3.4 million. And as you're aware, we do prepare a structurally balanced budget. So there's a corresponding reduction in our uses of funds, which I'm gonna review in attachment B in the next few slides. Uh, this ultimately reduces our healthcare delivery contingency appropriation and is not a reduction of any services that we shared with you earlier this year. Um, most of what you're going to see on the next couple screens um, is really the result of continuing to vet our business cases throughout July and working with our team members to make sure that we had things in the right line item. Um, and so for an example, in healthcare services on this slide, you'll see um, a reduction in primary care. That's not a reduction of services or program. That is simply moving some dollars that were in there in a business case to the salary line item, which is on the next page and some dollars to the specialty care line item, which is the next line below. And then for example, the 25,000 you see in post-acute care, that is being moved to the specialty care. So again, the last part of this budget process is really just getting things uh, more appropriately fine-tuned into the right area. And I would like to stress, we just continue to work through those robust business cases throughout the summer. Um, and that was driving a lot of this. So we also received a question from the board of managers regarding uh, the $7.3 million in immediate service delivery areas of specialty transitions of care, healthcare for the homeless and behavioral health and substance use disorder services. Uh, those slides are in the appendix uh, for your reference, but we did have um, our colleagues in healthcare services present at length on June 30th, as well in strategic planning committee uh, presentations about these additional services that we're hoping to implement uh, through these budgeted dollars this year. So I wanted to stress a couple things. Those projects are all in this section, mostly in this section of the budget. Um, the staff will be on the next page, um, but they're going to be aligned with where we think we're going to deliver the care. So if we anticipate working with one of our FQHC partners to deliver a new program that you're going to see, that would be in the primary care line item. If we um, anticipate um, adding new community health workers in, or dietitians, that would be in the salary line item. Um, and so those are incorporated throughout with a lot of those dollars uh, being in these first five lines of the section, maybe primary care, specialty care, post-acute pharmacy. So I just wanted to orient where those are found in the budget. And again, those were being those being new services, those are not approved yet. They would be approved uh, with the approval of this budget. Another example is just to stress that we do also have existing dollars in our budget for many of those areas. So for example, in our healthcare for the homeless services, we currently provide um, throughout our MAP population, which is estimated to be about 25% of our MAP population who are homeless or at risk of becoming homelessness 
through our existing primary care contracts, hospital care, and specialty clinics. So these dollars are in addition to that 25% of our MAP population that we're already serving. A few other highlights here, um, additional updates on the premium assistance program to ensure that we have um, enough funds in there to cover what we think we will need to add additional uh, high-risk members to that program, which has been very successful. And then one area I'd like to highlight where we added dollars into the budget, um, it's, it's really here and in our capital reserves, is in our other professional goods and services. And then you'll see on the next page, capital reserves. We have continued to work with our partners uh, throughout um, our clinical uh, network and existing clinical facilities. And we are increasing our um, estimates for what we could potentially need. Um, and in the operating budget, that would be things that we can't capitalize. So there's additional dollars in there for ensuring that we have funds available for um, facilities or equipment that couldn't be capitalized. And then you'll see an additional about just over $8 million that we have added to what we would put in the capital reserve next year to ensure that we had enough cash reserves to fund um, the needs of our clinical facilities, non-clinical facilities, um, equipment needs, technology needs, and um, additional areas. And I'm gonna go through the capital budget on a, on a later slide. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Again, a little bit more information about what we think we're gonna see in market adjustments. So additional dollars were added, um, cap, uh, capital projects that We've moved to the capital line item that were um, talked through when we uh, vetted our business cases. So we shared these slides with you uh, and we will look forward to reporting on this in a more detailed manner in FY22 as well. But in June, we started, we shared this, um, the healthcare delivery programs by department or functional area uh, at the request of one of the board of managers Members, we did add this first line, the salaries. Uh, we did receive several questions about salaries, number of FTEs, um, new FTEs um, in each of our departments. And we think that this um, gives a really robust um, response to that. So for both our healthcare delivery programs, which are outlined here, um, again, as I mentioned, what's changed from June um, we did have a couple positions added to this clinical services and medical management that were formerly in primary care that we just were, again, working through the business cases to determine would that be staff dollars, salary dollars, or would that be um, contracted dollars. In the administration area, we also have an additional administration position, again, through that business case process. And as we work through those and wrap that up. So we've um, added that line to both of these uh, uh, department functional uh, overviews of the administration and um, healthcare delivery programs. As I mentioned, we also have uh, capital reserves in. Uh, so what's in our budget is what we anticipate allocating to the capital reserves. The capital reserves we presented earlier this year is an ongoing uh, management of the approved projects as well as uh, ensuring we have reserves available for you know, um, the weather incident that we had in February and boiler needs and things that wouldn't be covered by insurance. So um, we do maintain capital reserves in these areas. Um, we do anticipate uh, transferring additional $12.5 million into those cash reserves next year um, and as I outlined, it is really, as we have continued to move forward with the financing plans for the approved projects that you have, as well as some new projects that we foresee coming in FY22. So um, specifically in the facilities and operations, we do uh, uh, have a project uh, with one of our, with our partner community care at Chalmers, which I think you all have heard of, which is the uh, partnership with HACA. Um, we anticipate additional resources may be needed for that. Um, so there's an increase in uh, estimates there. 
And um, we also anticipate additional capital needs uh, potentially for construction equipment, medical equipment, as we also will be looking at um, expanding uh, the location in Pflugerville. So as that work continues, we wanna make sure that we have the reserves available um, as that need is there. Those would be for existing facilities. And just a quick highlight on the major capital projects that the board has approved. Um, the board has approved um, several of these earlier this year uh, and last year with the EPIC project. Uh, we do anticipate the capitalized part of that wrapping up today. The project, the implementation uh, has gone live and it's been very successful. So our role in the capital investment, we anticipate wrapping up this year, um, but we will continue to um, use capital reserves uh, are anticipated as Jeff mentioned for Colony Park at this time. Um, and then um, making sure that um, we have enough um, of the dollar, that we are tracking the dollars in the approved budgets um, that the board has approved. So we also, we did receive additional questions about the uh, administrative consolidation and clinical project. And I would like to highlight that the board did approve this budget on June 14th in a presentation and a, an action, as well as we, we did host a public input session on August 4th about the issuance of the certificates of obligation. So with that, I would like to um, just talk about what's next um, as we are in August. Uh, we do anticipate returning to the board on August 25th uh, with our uh, request to set uh, the maximum tax rate. Uh, at this point, we, these numbers that we have, we do not anticipate changing unless something significant were to come up that would, that would warrant that. Um, so we wanted to give this presentation to you with plenty of time for additional questions if you have them, as well as uh, just enough time for you to look through the numbers and feel comfortable with that action on August 25th. We have another August uh, 26 community conversation, which um, we look forward to before we start um, the public hearing for the tax rate, uh, as well as that final vote on the tax rate and the budget September 9th. At that point, we will take the proposed tax rate and budget to the Travis County Commissioners for their final approval on September 21st. So with that, I think we can open it up to questions. Thank you. Let's see if we can get everybody uh, back here. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate um, all of the hard work that has gone into this for, for many years, quite frankly. And Jeff, thank you for uh, um, your guidance and Lisa, and um, I know that uh, we've had a budget analyst who's come on in recent years, thank you, and to, to everyone else who's been working so hard on this. I think that um, if it were not for the work that we've been doing for probably, Jeff, you said the past four or five years, we would not have been in a position, frankly, to do all that we've been doing over the past 18 months um, with COVID and with also um, the build out of um, new um, clinics in the Eastern Crescent, which is so important uh, to us, and also um, providing um, additional, other additional healthcare services. So thank you very much. Members, I'll open it up to questions at this point. Questions. Okay. I am, yes, Manager Jones. Well, I don't want to be the only one to ask questions, but... Oh, I can come up with one. Don't worry. Yeah. I do have a couple of a sort of strategic questions that I wanted to ask, and uh, perhaps we can go through them. Uh, I agree with you, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, the agency has done a great job and its leadership in getting us over the last several years to be able to accommodate the challenges we face over the last 18 months. But as we go into these next several months and even to next year. One of the questions is our ability to build and make aware, make services even more available in those hard to reach areas through non-traditional means, such as 
a telemedicine, uh, virtual uh, visits, the new facilities we're building and other things. So my first question from an outreach point of view is, are we posed or positioned to be able to strategize and communicate to the community our commitment to do more than just the physical service delivery model, but also others and what efforts are we undertaking? That's the first question. And then the second question, I'll, I'll be quiet here, is do we, are we looking at other providers? I know I've had this conversation with several in terms of our method by which we provide service. We are a healthcare district that use our partners to provide. And most of those providers are FQHCs. And traditionally that is the way that makes a lot of sense. But are there non-traditional non-FQHCs we're considering to develop a market, a partnership to provide services for particular for targeted populations and those at greater risk. So uh, with that said, I'll sit back and try and listen to the answer. Thank you, uh, Mike Gieson, did you want to respond? And let me say, I appreciate um, your questions and I particularly do want to focus on this issue of, as I say, uh, make new friends, but keep the old. We have use different modalities um, during COVID. Um, we were able to, I think, make some great strides forward in telemedicine and telehealth that I think our community should have made faster, many in the community. And we certainly don't wanna go backwards. We wanna go forwards while providing the traditional means of healthcare, but also continuing to go forward with the telemedicine and telehealth and others. So thank you um, for that question, Mandra Jones. Uh, Mike Gieselin? Yeah, so I'll, I'll lead off with a very uh, general high level answer to, to both of your questions and thank you. Um, and then I'll ask others to, to, to chime in because um, there's a lot of detail that could go into those questions in terms of being responsive. Uh, short answer to your, both, of your, both of your questions is yes. Um, not only considering going forward in the future, but currently um, or either in the past have been doing and will continue to do and continue to improve upon. So it's, um, again, it, it goes back to the, to the prior agenda item where it's always continually taking it to the next level where we need to be. Um, I think, you know, when you, if you could rewind the tape back to certain strategic planning committee meetings where staff presented uh, very in-depth and you saw some of it today uh, as, a, as a refresher, but in-depth presentations on specialty care, lines of service expansion, uh, our systems-based equity uh, work that we've done. Um, all of that is, is in, I mean, it's pretty all encompassing, right? But it's immediate as well as near-term or mid-term and then long-term uh, doing exactly just that. It's what other modalities do we need to be investing in or more importantly, other gaps that are causing health disparities uh, through non-traditional modalities. And let's just for the sake of conversation, call that an in-person visit, right? But outside of that in-person visit, what all needs to be done in addition to what we've been doing and what we're currently doing and, and are planning on doing for this fiscal year. And in terms of the outreach on that, um, that uh, again, that has been ongoing and that will continue um, You know, using the model that we have on a needs-based. And I don't think I'm, there's, there's a name for the model and I'll ask somebody from Outreach and Comms to correct me on that, but that will continue to be part of the healthcare experience. Communications and outreach for us isn't just a, a thing that happens here on, over on the side. It has to be incorporated with um, that overall healthcare experience that happens either in or outside of the clinic. Um, I'll pause there because I've just, again, started off the answer directionally, but uh, I'll ask others to chime in and please don't be bashful. John Morgan, please. Hi, good evening, managers. Uh, can you hear me okay, uh, Chair Greenberg? Great. Yes, um, so I'll just add a few comments to Mike's. Um, and happy to uh, discuss this. This is uh, what we you know, fortunately get to, get to work on every day. But I will um, go, go back to uh, the first agenda item and the systems planning effort that we are now entering into the third phase of. And uh, Manager Jones, part of that engagement is really doing that deep dive analysis into each of the components of our systems, so whether that's primary care, specialty care, hospital care, post-acute services, and really doing a, an in-depth assessment uh, of our needs and gaps in those areas. And that includes looking at 
the geographic distribution of services to your question, as well as the demographic distribution and access to those services. Uh, so that is part of what uh, we hope to come back to the board with is a, uh, an assessment of those needs, a prioritization of those needs, and then a, a multi-year plan for us to, to build the next phase of the system that we're, that we're trying to build and that we aspire to. Um, regarding your second question, uh, we're certainly uh, always looking at, at providers that we, can, that we can work with that we may not be working with today. Um, that's really an ongoing exercise in uh, multiple different service areas. Um, you know, I think your, your question was really in the primary care space with your comment around the FQHCs. And um, I'd remind the board that we um, recently in, in the past few years uh, started a partnership with a, a provider that we typically have not contracted with. Um, and that was the UT School of Nursing. Uh, we're very... Um, happy to have their, their partnership and uh, working with them to build additional capacity in the community, but that's certainly not where it ends. You know, each, each of the different component areas or the services that we look at, I think have different considerations, um, but we, we are certainly open to working with other providers in the community, particularly if there's a, an opportunity to reach populations that may otherwise be, be hard to engage with. So. I think we're, we're absolutely open to those discussions. We have several ongoing discussions now with potential partners um, and we'll continue to look at those opportunities going forward. Thank you very much. I know that um, all of us and in the entire organization, you know, strive each and every day uh, to provide the best services that we can um, to our population and to address those um, systemic issues that we see, the health disparities and inequity. So thank you very much. Uh, other questions, managers? Yes, Manager Brinson. You're on mute. You're on mute, Manager Brinson. You're still on mute. There you go. You went back on mute. You're on mute, Manager Brinson. <laughs> um, Manager Brinson, let me see if there's somebody else who has a question while you, um, you, see, you appear to have be having a time. Sorry. Okay. You're now good. can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So I, cool. forgive me if I, I'm interpreting it wrong, but when I looked at it, it appears that we're significantly under budget on a number of our projects. Is that correct? Um, I, I think, are you talking about on the capital projects? That the capital projects slide that I showed. You talking about the clinics, such as in the Eastern Crescent? That chart. Oh, now I can't hear y'all. Oh, there we go. Okay. Are you talking Thanks. about Manager Brinson? That chart that showed the clinics that we're building and whatnot. Yes. 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 The key is Lisa. You want to address that, Lisa? Yes. I, I would say that. Uh, I would say that no, we're not under budget. It's timing. It's um, that that work has started. And similar to healthcare dollars that you spend, I don't think the dollars are directly correlated to how much progress has been made. Okay. okay. Uh, but um, that is really just an indicator of how much we have spent uh, to date on those projects. Okay, thank you. And, and it's a year end estimate. Okay. Um, so that work continues. We have a proposal posted for construction services at, in Hornsby Bend and one coming forth for Dell Valley. Uh, the bulk of the cost in those construction projects is going to be in the construction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that'll pick up rather quickly, but great question. Yes, and, and I think it, it's one to keep in mind um, that we, um, I believe in strategic planning, we did recently, and Manager Bell, please correct me if I'm wrong, have a pretty in-depth presentation on the various projects and where we are in these projects. Um, Lisa, it may be helpful to just have some kind of snapshot for members um, along with the budget materials you're sending out for each of these projects to show, um, you know, kind of where we are, what phase, what we think the sure, total That's a great idea to make that correlation. Yeah, what phase, so kind of a cash flow. What phase are we in? Cash flow, the um, total number of years we think to complete the project. So I think if we could get a snapshot for each one of those to accompany 
um, our future budget presentation, and maybe you know, send it out before them, that that would be very helpful to have. Absolutely, we'll work with Stephanie on that. Thank you, yeah, I know that you working with Stephanie um, exactly can, can put that together, a snapshot of each one, but I think we just need to pull together for each project a, I'll call it a, a project sheet, uh, right, with, as I said, the, the cash flow, the phases, uh, the total number of years to completion, so on and so forth. Thank you. And um, Chair Greenberg, if I may, I, I wanted to make sure that, in, you know, what you're asking for is is certainly preliminary, and that's right. and that would be the intended use, just for the board's edification. Because, like I say, we like Lisa mentioned, there's those contracts that are right. out to bid. Right. No, no, now it would be at a. It would be, I think, Lisa, you understand at a high level um, draft. Yeah. It would be um, not not a budget, but a plan. So this is the capital improvements plan for each one of these, right? right? And showing okay. on a planning basis the you know, number of years for the project, the cash flow, the phases, right? Yes, yes. Does that work for you, Lisa, and for you, Stephanie? Yes, and, and actually that's how we do our planning in that long-term right. plan that we showed. And we provided that slide as part of the appendix tonight as well. Um, so um, I, I think it's uh, just marrying that that's up with the her. activities that Stephanie right. and her team have outlined for you. That's um, right. And then tracking it. That's exactly right. Thank you. Chair Greenberg, if there's no yeah. other questions by the board, I'd like to make a few comments when it's appropriate. Um, certainly. Um, are there any other um, questions from board members? If not, I'll recognize um, Mike Giesel. Any other questions? Uh, Manager Jones? Yeah, it, it, uh, this is goes to Mr. Uh, Morgan. So did I understand you clear to say that you all are open to looking at other providers to work with you all in terms of service delivery in some of the targeted hard to reach population. Yes, sir. Did I, did I say something that was unclear, sir? No, I just want to confirm that that's what I heard. No, that's what no, we, we, we absolutely are. Um, I think we, we try to prioritize those interests as well, based on the you know the the needs of our the needs that we are currently aware of, as well as this upcoming needs assessment, in terms of what what areas we would focus on. But um, suffice it to say that that we have um, we have needs for expansion and growth in a lot of different service areas. So there's there's certainly a lot of opportunity for community partners, you know, established providers, other folks in the community that that want to work and serve the uh, MAP and uninsured and, and safety net population, uh, there, there's a lot of opportunity to do so. So we're, we're happy to engage in those discussions. Great. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I thought I heard you say that you are looking on an ongoing basis at the demographics and the needs and on an ongoing basis looking to see if there are additional service providers. Is that correct? We are, and we're actively working through um, several of those uh, opportunities okay. right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Manager Jones. Anything else before I recognize uh, Mr. Gieslin? Okay, uh, Mike? Yes, thank you very much, members. Uh, we're pleased to um, bring this presentation to you all. And of course, as Lisa showed in the, in the calendar, there's other opportunities that we'll have to discuss of the proposed budget for fiscal year 22. But I, I wanna take this opportunity to thank Lester and Lisa and Jeff uh, for really helping to navigate us uh, through, the, through the budget. You know, three words come to mind and it's insight, skill, and precision. And what you're seeing, Central Health has always had a strong budget shop, but what you're seeing is just year over year continued improvement in the forecasting and putting pencil to paper and really being as precise as possible because we want to be good stewards with the taxpayer dollars. Also, is, is shown in the, the, the financial forecasts and, and some of the uh, prefacing slides that, that Jeff talked or um, discussed, um, we, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of um, years before us and, and prior boards even that were able to position us, not just for the sake of having a static position to be able to say, this is what our balance sheet is in any given month, but really being in a position to 
change care in ways that truly does bring about and define health equity in our time, not, not just in theory, but in, in practice. And that's happening today. We're gonna to continue to do that. And so we really do appreciate the opportunity to bring this to you as board of managers, but also wanted to provide some context and seeing where we're headed with this. This is not just a budget. This is about healthcare for those that we're privileged to serve. And so thank you all very much, appreciate it. It certainly is, and thank you. Members, is there anything else uh, at this time? If not, I will move on to our next agenda item. Our next agenda item, agenda item number three, is confirm the next regular board meeting date, time, and location. Managers, our next Central Health Board of Managers meeting is a special call meeting scheduled for Monday, August 23rd, 2021 at 5 p.m. remotely by video conference. There will also be a full Board of Managers meeting later that same week on Wednesday, August 25th, uh, immediately following the 5 p.m. Executive Committee meeting. At this time, I'm ready to accept a motion for adjournment. I move adjournment. Manager Bell moves adjournment. Is there a second? Manager Brinson? All right, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Any abstaining? Thank you, members. We are adjourned. Thank you, members. Thank you very much for your time and to all those who have participated. We appreciate you.